Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So just a couple comments about the exam. I have not finished grading exams, so I'm about I finished grading about half of the exams. So maybe today, if not today, um, definitely tomorrow. Uh, the grades, I don't, um, they're probably, as of right now, looking at them, my guess is they'll would be a curve. I have no idea how much the curve will be until I grade everybody's. Um, but, so if you have your grade, it may be different uh, after I grade everybody's and then see if there's, you know, a curve. And if you haven't, don't have a grade yet, don't worry about it, I'm still grading, okay? So you'll see it, it'll show up as soon as I finish that grading your test. Um, so that so that's the what I wanted to say about the exam. We'll go over the solutions also as soon as I'm done grading it. So maybe Wednesday, if not Wednesday, uh, definitely Monday of next week, we would go over the solutions. So if you have questions about the exam, I would wait until we, we go over the solutions in class. Okay, and then you can, and then we can talk about it from there. A quick question. Sorry, um, are you free after class? Because I need to talk to you about something real quick. Okay, yeah. All right, I just wanted to ask first. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so then we're on to the cycles. And to begin with, we're on chapter nine. Okay, so this deals with the gas power cycles, right? Chapter 10 is uh, the vapor power cycle. So that's when we start adding in uh, late, basically using the late energy, uh, the phase change of fluids. But in this one, we have gas. And then chapter 11 is our refrigeration cycles, okay? All right, so we'll be looking at gas power cycles, okay? Um, so it'll be a gas in these ones. So we'll have some simplifying assumptions we'll get to use. We'll look at reciprocating engines, closed and open power cycles that have gas in them. Uh, the main, we'll have problems with auto, diesel, um, not really. I'll show you the lecture slides, Sterling and Erickson, but we won't um, focus on problems with them, okay? Uh, but we'll also have the Brayton cycle, which is the kind of the gas turbine cycle, um, which they have modifications like regeneration, intercooling, reheating, and um, that you can do to the Brayton cycle. Uh, then there's uh, also the jet propulsion cycle is basically the for uh, jet propulsion, so it's the Brayton cycle, but modified for that. Okay, and some simplifying assumptions for any second law analysis you want to do with the power cycles. Okay, so let's get started. We have the actual versus ideal. So ideal cycle, it's a cycle that looks like the actual cycle, but it's made up of internally reversible process. So you have in green here, we have this dashed is what the actual cycle is. And we approximate that cycle with the ideal one in red here. Okay, so we would have state one here, state two here, state three here and a state four here, okay? So it's not exact, but it, it helps approximate the cycle and, and simplify it. So then we can analyze it quicker and get a, an answer a little faster, okay? Reversible cycles, we talked about the Carnot cycle in chapter six. So it's our highest thermal efficiency of all heat engines, okay, between the same temperatures, but they are totally reversible, okay? Where a ideal, these, these cycle like down here this ideal cycle is only internally reversible. Uh, the Carnot and there's a couple others are uh, totally reversible. Okay. So as a reminder we have thermal efficiency for our, our uh, heat engine okay, or, or per unit mass. We gotta divide out the mass. We have work net over Q and work net is work out minus work in, okay? And then Q in is just the heat that we add in, okay? It's not, it doesn't include the heat out, just the heat in, that's our required input. Work net has the work out minus the work in, not just 
the work out, we had to subtract the work in any work we have to put back into the cycle. All right, so again, ideal cycles are internally reversible. Okay, Carnot has the X, and so they're not necessarily externally reversible. So it'll be a lower, so it's less than we'll get in these ideal cycles. We'll get a, a lower efficiency than the totally reversible, okay, so then not Carnot, okay. But it'll still be higher than if we had the actual data of the PV diagram and got our efficiency from that. Um, these ideal cycles are still uh, have a higher efficiency than those actual cycles. All right, so some simplifications. Um, we have, we're not going to have any friction. Okay, so working fluid doesn't have any pressure drop. So if there's pipes, say connecting a heat exchanger connecting a turbine there's not going to be any pressure drop during that that pipe or any pressure drop within the heat exchanger because it's flowing through there okay that would involve um, fluid dynamics um, uh, equations combined with thermal equations to get that those numbers so that adds complexity so with these idealizations we're trying to minimize complexity um, and get our uh, kind of a simpler solution and only add complexity when we need it to analyze, okay? Um, all expansion and compression strokes are quasi-equilibrium. Okay? And then any pipes or anything are well insulated, so there's no heat transfers to them. So if you're connecting, again, a heat exchanger, the outlet of the heat exchanger to a turbine, during that pipe, that pipe that flows from the heat exchanger to the turbine, we're neglecting any heat transfer out of that and saying basically the same state out of the um, heat exchanger is the same as what's going into the turbine. Okay. The other thing that's huge in these cycles is these diagrams. Okay, as a reminder, the PV diagram, right, is you know our we're showing work here. We have no work from one to two because it's a constant volume. Then we have expansion from two to three, three to four and then compression from four to one. And we Inside here is our net work, right? So if we wanted to increase our work net, we could start moving three to the right or two up or one down. We can start thinking about how do we increase that area inside, okay? Um, PS diagram deals with heat transfer. So PV is our work, right? Looks at work. The TS deals with heat. Okay, because Q is T delta S, right, in the simplest case. So if we look at that, we can see, you know, kind of underneath T delta S, like if we're, say, integrating it or something, we have kind of our heat addition or in our ratio of areas. So it shows, I'm talking here, ratio of area closed by the cycle curve to the area under the heat addition process curve, okay? So heat addition in this case is one to two maybe, or two to three, okay? So that ratio of areas is our, so if this is only the heat addition from three to four, and then we have our work net, so it'd be the work net area divided by, say, this area, okay? That would be the thermal efficiency, that area modification. So we would want to think about how we could increase or change points to increase the, you know, you want to keep, maybe you want to keep the same heat in, but you want to increase the work net, right? So that would be maybe changing how, what's going on with one here. Or four, maybe we get four further down or something like that. So modifying the states or the processes to increase your thermal efficiency. All right, so Carnot, we talked about this in chapter six briefly, and again, I'll talk about it briefly again. Our Carnot, simplified, it's one minus TL over TH. It has, again, totally reversible cycles, so we could reverse the directions if we wanted. But state one, we have isothermal heat addition, so temperature is being held constant, we have heat in. Then we have isentropic expansion from two to three, and then 
constant temperature heat rejection, and then isentropic compression. Okay, if we look at this on a TS diagram, it looks even nicer. We have, because we have two isentropic processes, so that makes vertical lines, right? Four to one. And then we have our heat addition at constant temperature, and then isotropic expansion, and then heat addition at con or heat rejection at constant temperature. Okay, so we see our nice diagram there. Okay, one thing that the Carnot helps us talk about is we TL we want TL to be as low as possible, right? And TH to be as high as possible. That would increase the efficiency, and TL being down would increase the efficiency. But we can use that same idea in other cycles, right? If we kind of look at the heat addition process for a, a non, not Carnot, but the same idea happens. If we want to raise the temperature which we're adding heat, okay, and we want to decrease the temperature which we're rejecting heat to increase the thermal efficiency. Here's a study flow of what it would look like for a Carnot, but through a um, study flow system. We can also de derive the Carnot efficiency of the cycle. So we've got the TS diagrams there. We have thermal efficiencies work net over QN from our heat engine. So we have these diagrams in uh, chapter six in Thermo One, and if we just do our COE around this heat engine, we know that work net is QN minus Q out. Well, we can put that this equation, the Q out minus QN, for work net, and then divide by QN, and we get this equation. Okay. Then we just need an equation for Q out and QN. Okay. Well. It's isothermal heat addition and heat rejection, so that you know allows us to use that equation where we take T out of the integral and we have T delta S for heat addition. Okay, so using T delta S for heat in, T delta S for heat out. Well, the entropy is the same from two and three and four and one. Okay, so that's why they're setting it there. While we set, and then we plug in Q out here. Q in here, and the entropy, the delta S is cancel, and we have our one minus TL over TH again. All right, assumptions, air standard assumptions. So we'll be using that, okay? If we look at an actual cycle, so we would have, say, air coming in and fuel coming in in a combust, in a combustion chamber, and then you get products out of uh, combustion products maybe CO2, water, nitrogen. Well, what we'll instead, for the ideal, look at it as just adding heat, okay? That we're just adding heat to air. So we, our fluid is just air, but we have a heat addition process, okay? And it's a pretty valid assumption because uh, typically you have a very high amount of air to fuel. So your ratio of air to fuel is very high. So the properties, even in the combustion products, are very, very similar uh, to air, okay? Only a small deviation due to the fuel, okay? But to actually analyze it with combustion products, complexity goes way up. So we use this uh, just looking at it as air, okay? So the working fluid is just air continuously through the cycle, okay? So we neglect the fuel influence, and the fuel just kind of adds heat. Okay. Um, it'll be an ideal gas. Okay. They're, all processes are internally reversible, not externally, so just reversible inside the cylinder or inside the cycle, but not externally outside of it. So again, I talked about the heat addition process from an external source for combustion, and then the exhaust process is just a heat rejection, okay? So heat out. Uh, so this is air standard cycle. Cold air standard just means we're just going to take the specific heats at room temperature, so not even include the, the that specific heats change with temperature. Okay? 
we'll just say it's always at that, so it's a cold air standard assumption. So that makes it simpler to analyze, but again, you lose a little bit more of your accuracy that way. So air standard assumption, air standard cycle is just we're applying the air standard assumption to the cycle. All right, so we'll start with reciprocating engines. So the piston's moving up and down, okay? We have main two, spark ignited and compression ignition, okay? So the main parameter we have in those is the, is the compression ratio, okay? So it's the max volume divided by the min. The volume of bottom dead center to top dead center. So here, the piston would be, here's the piston at bottom dead center, here's the piston at top dead center, okay? So then, if the piston's at top dead center, you only have this volume here. If it's at bottom center, you have this volume plus all this too, okay? So that's your max, and then your min is just when it's up at the top, okay? So your stroke is that distance you move from bottom dead to top dead, or from top dead to bottom dead center. So that volume that gets displaced from top dead center to bottom dead center is called the displacement volume. So that's what's shaded here. So when it goes, this and goes from bottom dead center you see here to top dead center, this is the clearance volume, but the volume you displace is called the displacement volume. So Volume max is your displacement volume plus your clearance volume, right? All right, another parameter is mean effective pressure. So mean effective pressure, it normalizes your work, okay? So in this case, you see mean effective pressure um, if we look at the PV diagram, right? We take our actual cycle and this is be our work net, right? So we would have small engine would have, this point would be a different volume because their small engine would have a small volume as its max. Let's say we had spark ignited engine that's 50 horsepower or we have a car engine. Now it's 100 horsepower, 200 horsepower. Now that that volume, that volume max is going to be larger because it's a larger displacement engine. Okay, so now that volume max is going to be different. So your PV diagram is going to have different volumes that go along with the pressure. Well, by changing it to mean effective pressure, we take that work net that we have here and we divide it. Take that work net, we divide it by our displacement volume. So this is just the displacement volume. If we take it and divide it by the displacement volume, basically you're creating this mean effective pressure. That average pressure that occurs if it was the same pressure through the whole cycle. So if you had a 50 horsepower engine again, you might be here with displacement, that mean effective pressure. But now if you um, take an engine and add and do that car engine that's 200 has similar technologies now it's displacement maybe over here but you have a similar mean effective pressure okay so you're, you're able to compare this value from different size engines and not test every single engine that's out there to see what you get out of it you basically compare it mean effective pressures because now that's kind of a normalization because more displacement volume gives you more so if you increase your displacement volume, you get, you increase your air, which means you can increase your fuel, which means you can increase your power, right? Or work. All right, so then let's start with our auto cycle. So this is the ideal cycle for a spark ignited engine, okay? So this one, we have the actual up here on the top, this whole top section of that line is our actual cycle. Down here is our ideal cycle, so the ideal auto you see. 
All right, so on the top, we'll start with that, okay? So we have, we're starting in the compression stroke right here, okay? Both the intake and exhaust valve are closed. We have air and fuel mixture inside the cylinder, and the piston is moving up, so we're compressing, okay? So we're bottom dead center, and we're compressing, right? Compress, compress, raising the pressure and temperature. All right, we get to this point, and our spark plug ignites, and our air fuel mixture combusts and releases chemical energy. Right? So we have the combustion part that's very rapid, all right, but then we're pistons moving down and we're expanding. So that's our power expansion stroke right there. Now the exhaust valve opens right here, okay? And that creates this rush of fuel of exhaust out of the exhaust port, right? Intake valves still closed, still closed, right? So it rushes the exhaust and drops the pressure of your pressure inside the cylinder, okay? And now we get to the exhaust stroke. Now the pressure's dropped, and now the piston can just push the remainder of you know the air that's in here, the exhaust in here, out of the exhaust port. Without this portion of the exhaust blowdown right there, we would be pushing against the high pressure. If we didn't let it rush out, this exhaust, when we're pushing it out, pressure would still be much higher inside the cylinder and we'd have a lot of back pressure pushing against the piston while we're trying to push it up and out. So we would have some lost um, energy there and lost work. Okay, so then we have our exhaust. We've now um, start at top dead center and we open up the intake valve right here and move from top dead center down and pull a new fuel air mixture into the cylinder. Okay, as the piston moves down, it's pulling air into the cylinder, okay, creating a vacuum for the, the air fuel mixture to fill. All right, and then we go all the way down to bottom dead center and we start our, our cycle again in the compression stroke. Okay. All right, so then that's the actual. The ideal, we simplify this, okay? All right, so then we have isentropic compression here. So we start at one, and we compress up to two. And it's isentropic, which is adiabatic and reverse. All right, so that means piston moves up isentropically, we get to state two. Now, at constant volume, so the volume is being maintained constant in the PV diagram, we add heat, okay? And that's our simplification for our combustion. So volume's constant, we add heat, all right? Then we expand isentropically. Okay, so we have our isentropic expansion from three to four. And then we simplify our exhaust blowdown process right here is a just heat rejection from all that energy that we're just pushing the exhaust out of the tailpipe. So that's a constant volume, we're rejecting heat. That's our heat rejection process. All right, so we have on the TS diagram, which is being shown here, okay, we have our isentropic compression, all right, so we raise our temperature. Uh, entropy is the same as isentropic. We have a constant volume heat addition, so we're adding heat, which means we're increasing entropy. So we're going from left to right as we add heat. Then we isentropically expand to four. So again, for expansion, isentropic means we're dropping our temperature. And then we have a heat rejection. So we go from right to left because we're rejecting heat, we're decreasing our entropy, right? Just like here we are increasing it when we add heat. And the other thing to know is 
So most, you know, your car engines are for one cycle, which is all those processes mentioned. So the intake, compression, um, expansion, exhaust stroke is, those are four strokes, which means it's two revolutions or 720 degrees, okay? So that's a four stroke engine. It goes from top, bottom, each top dead center to bottom dead center, bottom dead center to top dead center. Each of that is a, a single stroke. So 180 degrees is one stroke, okay? So there's four strokes in one cycle. Two stroke engine does all this in two strokes. So it's only one revolution, only 360 degrees. So here's an example of one of a two stroke engine. And also I have it on canvas under that link for animated engines. Okay, two stroke engines, um, they're less efficient, okay, because they don't have as much time to do each stroke. So each compression, expansion, all that's being crammed in a shorter amount of time. So they don't do everything as efficient, but they're sim you can make them simpler, okay? So that means if they're simpler, you can make them inexpensive. They have a high power to weight ratio and power to volume ratio, which makes them um, popular for you know, motorcycles and lawnmowers. But you can't have them, or they don't see them in cars because that low efficiency keeps them from passing any emission standards, okay? You have a lot of fuel that can end up right out, you know, intake and exhaust ports open at the same time. You have fuel air here. When the piston's down, you have some of that fuel air going right out the exhaust, and right? so it makes it uh, challenging to meet the emission standards. All right, the other thing, the in the, ideal auto cycle that w happens that we simplify in thermo two is you have the intake and exhaust stroke so from four you have the exhaust going to one and then from zero we go back and that's our intake stroke and they just cancel off because we're assuming they're both at atmospheric okay for things where it's not you have to take my internal combustion engine class where we'll talk about um, add, adding complexity to these different cycles. All right, so those are, that's the cycle. Now we gotta add equations to this, okay? All right, so we have a reciprocating engine is a closed system, so we use our closed conservation energy, closed system conservation energy. So if we have Q minus W equals delta U, and we divide by the mass, we have lowercase Q, W, and delta U. Any single process has only heat or work in the auto cycle, right? Isentropic is adiabatic, so one to two, there's no heat. Two to three is only heat, but it counts the volume, so there's no work, right? Three to four, just work, no heat. Four to one, just heat, no work. So it, each process gets canceled off the heater work term, okay? All right, so if we ultimately want to calculate the thermal efficiency, we have, again, back from the earliest slide, work net over Q in, and we can put in our work net equation, get it to one minus Q out over Q in, and that means we need equations for Q out and Q in, right? So, so for Q in, that's two to three. It's Q, it's just constant volume, so there's no work. So you have Q equals delta U. If we put in CV delta T for ideal gas, constant specific heats, we have CV delta T. And then we can do the same thing for four to one, okay, CV delta T. So we plug that in, and we get this equation. The CV cancels, we have this equation. This one is more for the plotting down here. Okay, um, so we get that equation. We also have equations. Basically, since one to two is isentropic and three to four is isentropic, it's ideal gas. We have the ideal gas isentropic relationships. And we use them with volume since we have volume here and volume here, okay? Another thing again, we have the compression ratio. 
we were ready to find it. So in this case, it's volume one is our max volume divided by volume two, which is our min. But also, two and three are the same volume, and four and one are the same volume. So this could be four, and this could be three. Right? That's also the compression ratio, because the auto cycle, everything's occurring at top dead center and bottom dead center. So each of the states. Okay, so that means for V2 over V1, we could put one minus one divided by R in there. Right? The inverse of the compression ratio. Same with here. Okay. All right, so if we kind of manipulated this isentropic process and put it into this equation. We can, in, you know, move, move around ratio of temperatures. Is basically what they're doing here is creating ratios of temperatures, and then put these equations in there and put that compression ratio I just talked about in for the volume ratio. You can simplify it to this nice general equation for um, auto cycles uh, thermal efficiency, and in that we see. You just have compression ratio and ratio of specific heats. Okay, so if we plot that, we increase compression ratio. We have our thermal efficiency here. Okay, so we see as we increase compression ratio, we have a higher uh, thermal efficiency. If our ratio of specific heats lower, okay, so say air at higher temperatures, we decrease that thermal efficiency. Or if we add say a noble gas being used, then we'd have this high ratio of specific heats and thermal efficiency would be higher. So that's one of the reasons why, say like in a Stirling engine, they might use a noble gas. Um, all right, so we have this kind of setup for the rate compression ratio versus thermal efficiency in a typical engine. So taking that 1.4 value for ratio of specific heats and plotting it, we get somewhere around here, and they constantly trying to push the compression ratio higher um, to get higher thermal efficiencies. But we're limited by auto ignition or engine knock with compression ratio of an auto cycle because oops, back here in the actual engine, it's air fuel that's getting compressed, right? We're pistons moving up, and it's air and fuel. So if we had too high of a compression ratio, we would be increasing the pressure and temperature of that air fuel mixture too high and actually starting combustion, right? Let's say we're compressing here and we just, we had such a high compression ratio that combustion started right here. Well, combustion is going to want to turn the engine the opposite way it's going, right? And that's not good, right? So we don't want combustion until the piston gets up to top dead center because then that extra release of energy will push the piston down. Right? So this limitation we have from auto ignition or engine knock, we don't want that to occur. We want the combustion to occur from the spark. Okay? All right, so then we have a diesel cycle, okay? Ideal for compression ignition, okay? In a diesel engine, Biggest difference in a compression ignition is air is only compressed. So in a gasoline engine, you're injecting fuel early enough for it to mix with air. So whether you do that in the port before it gets inside the cylinder or whether you direct inject, you're injecting so that you have air and fuel in here, okay? So then you can't go to as high as compression ratios because you would have that auto ignition. In a diesel or compression ignition, you're just compressing air here, and you're injecting fuel late. Your, your injection of fuel is how you time combustion, okay, when you want combustion to occur. And since you're compressing only air, you can use much higher compression ratios. Okay. This should be constant pressure. All right, so the biggest difference is the heat addition process. Okay, the heat addition process, so we still have isentropic compression, isentropic expansion, constant volume heat rejection, but we're adding heat at constant pressure. Okay, so the pressure is constant, and that's because we're adding heat 
we're injecting fuel, the fuel's got to evaporate, mix, um, atomize, and combust. Okay, so it takes time. So it doesn't happen as rapidly like a constant volume like the spark ignited, where it's fuel and air is already mixed. You have the spark and it initializes. Here we got, it takes time to inject the fuel, mix, combust. So it looks more like a constant pressure process. PS diagram is very similar to the auto cycle, the isentropic compression, where we're raising temperature, adding heat, isentropic expansion, and our constant volume heat rejection. For the auto, it would just look like this because it would be a constant volume heat addition. All right, so that's for the auto cycle, where V is constant. All right, so now we got to take it to the equations. Now we know how we're simplifying the diesel cycle. So again, we have Q minus W equals delta U, closed system, right? We have our thermal efficiency, one minus Q out of Q in, that stays the same, but our processes for Q in and Q out, right? Q out, it's constant volume heat rejection, so that's the same, right? We still get CV delta T, okay? So that we can insert there. But the heat in, while we are adding heat at constant pressure, there is also work that's occurring, right? Because two, and th is, we're going to three, we're expanding. So we're getting, there's work occurring, boundary work occurring while we're adding heat. Okay, so that means we have heat in and boundary work. That's a very common mistake to forget this, okay? All right, so then that's equals delta U. The boundary work, it's PV delta T. Or sorry, PV, PDV, sorry. Pressure, the integral is um, PDV. While it's constant pressure process, we can take P out of the integral, so it's P pressure times the change in volume. Then we have our delta U. Well, we can simplify this to delta H, which is CP delta T, All right? So then we have CP delta T, so we would have CV delta T for heat out and CP delta T for heat in. Well, if we just divide out the CV, we're gonna get ratio specific heats here, okay? All right, so we have a new parameter, though, in the diesel cycle. We have a cutoff ratio, and that's because we have state three is at a different volume. State two is at the minimum volume. One and four are at the max volume, right? So this defines compression ratio, but now we have this state that's wandering in the middle here, right? So the cutoff ratio is volume three divided by two defines the um, where that location of state three is. Okay, so if we do the same thing we did with the auto cycle, insert our isentropic relationships that we have for one to two and three to four, and our cutoff ratio and our compression ratio, we can derive a general efficiency equation that's dependent upon our compression ratio, our cutoff ratio, and our ratio of specific heats. Okay, so if we plot this now. And that's what's being shown down here. We compression ratio in our thermal efficiency. We have these different lines, right? Here is a cutoff ratio of four. Cutoff ratio of one means volume three is equal to volume two, and that would be a constant volume process then, and that's the auto cycle. So right here is the auto cycles curve. So what you see is the auto cycle is actually more efficient than a diesel cycle, All right? The problem again is because of auto ignition. You can't run as high of compression ratios in a spark ignited. So diesels by running that higher compression ratio end up getting a overall a better efficiency and that's why they're known for better fuel efficiency because of the higher compression ratios, not because the cycle itself is more efficient.
dual cycle, really that diesel cycle that we introduced and we talk about in this class uh, is more the old kind of what diesels behaved as more what's happening now is you have a constant volume and constant pressure combustion okay you have and then the ratio changes between each so and usually some injection you get an early combustion that's very rapid but then the rest of it's being waiting on the fuel injection for it to combust and mix and or mix and atomize and evaporate and all that All right, so Stirling and Erickson cycle. The big thing about these are they are have something new in it. They have this regenerator. Okay, so and basically the regenerator borrows energy from one part of the cycle and pays it back during another. So it's moving that energy inside the cycle. So it's not an external energy. So it's not a work out or a, a heat out or that's externally included in our thermal efficiency equation. It's internally mo moving that energy, okay? And we'll see some benefits to that. So in this case, we have a Stirling cycle, which has constant temperature expansion. We have a constant volume regeneration. So internally, from the working fluid to the regenerator, we have a constant temperature compression. We have a constant volume regeneration. All right, boom, lots of TS and PV diagrams. We have the Carnot, which we already talked about right here. Okay, the PV and the TS diagram. We have the Stirling and the Erickson cycle. The difference between the Stirling and the Erickson cycle, one is constant volume. One's constant pressure. So this is more like the open system. And this is the closed system version, right? So, because closed system, we're dealing with moving a piston around or something like that. So we're changing volumes. Open system, we typically have components that are connected with fluid flow, so then the pressure stays constant, okay? So in here, you can see kind of this, the regeneration process right here, the moving that thermal energy internal internally to the cycles, okay? The external heat transfer in and external out, okay? So here's kind of the idea, well, just a second, they're both Stirling and Erickson cycles are also totally reversible, okay? So that means the thermal efficiency of Stirling is equal to Erickson, which is equal to Carnot. So we have that same thermal efficiency equation. 1 minus TL over TH. So here's an example of a Stirling cycle on the left and an Erickson cycle on the right. So here we have a heat exchanger moving energy internally to the cycle. So we're moving uh, thermal energy from out of the turbine and moving that energy to what's coming out of that compressor before it goes into the turbine. Here's our external heat and work processes out of our cycle. The regenerator for a Stirling cycle, so this is a closed system, this is a simplified one, is we're adding heat during here. So we're adding heat while keeping the temp, while we're adding heat, this piston's expanding to keep the temperature the same. Then as we, we've expanded it out, now we're at state two. Okay, so we've moved that piston right here out. But now we're doing that constant volume process where both of these pistons move the same amount. So this one expands to three and this one expands. And so that fluid transfers heat to this, basically this is a porous plug. So it heats up that porous plug and drops the fluid temperature as that air flows through the porous plug. It puts that energy into that porous plug and we get this lower TL on the side. Now we compress this right piston and have heat rejection. So we same amount of heat we're getting out and compressing to keep that temperature the same, constant temperature. So the isothermal. And then we move and we move this piston. To, we got to go back up to this process, this state. So we go four to one. This piston moves to the left 
and this piston moves to the left the same amount. And what happens during that is now this gas that's here has to flow through that porous plug and its temperature gets raised from TL to TH. So it pulls back that thermal energy that was stored earlier. Okay, that's the regenerator, that's the porous, the porous plug in this case. All right, we have a Brayton cycle, okay? The Brayton cycle deals with the, basically it's a gas turbine cycle. Oh, I forgot to show you some videos. So of the internal combustion engines, I wanted to show you that. All right, before we go, we're gonna show you, or move on to the next slide. I wanted to show. Come on. All right. All right. So here's the videos I have on canvas. But here's it's an optical engine, so it's seeing inside the cylinder with the high. Basically, it has um, a window like maybe a sapphire window that can they can see through in a high speed camera to that. So let's play it pistons moving up. We have fuel going through the intake stroke. We have some compression. You see the spark and now we have combustion. It's occurring rapidly through. If the quality isn't showing up really well, you can go to Canvas and, and watch them. This one does the whole 720 degrees, okay? And so you can see here, we're at one of 720. So the degrees of pistons moving down, the intake valves open, we have fuel being injected through the port. So fuel and air is mixing, the intake valves closing, the pistons moving up. Compressing. Now at the top, we have our spark being ignited. So spark plug loads and then fuel ignites rapidly, a kernel goes out and then we have that flame front of combustion near constant volume. Now we have our expansion stroke as the piston moves down. Now the exhaust valve opens the exhaust blow down that brush out of that high pressure. And now the exhaust process with the piston moving up from bottom dead center to top dead center. Okay. All right, so let's get back to this. All right, Brayton cycle. So this is for gas turbines. So here, the open cycle gas turbine, closed cycle gas turbine. So in this case, we have we're compressing fresh air. We have our compressor, so it's pressure and temperatures raised. We go into our combustion chamber, add fuel, combustion products, leave the combustion chamber, expand through the turbine, and get rejected to the atmosphere. Um, and we pull in fresh air from a different location into the compressor again, okay, and just keep exhausting out here. The, again, work net is work out minus work in. The turbine creates work out, the compressor requires some work in. So there's some work from that turbine is going back to drive the compressor, okay? The net is what we get out. But we idealize it to our Brayton cycle, and that's what you see here. So we, again, think of it all as air, right? We don't, we're not including that issue of fuel, or have that air standard assumption. So we look at it as isentropic compression in the compressor. Okay, as we go through the compressor, we compress it, raise the pressure and temperature. Now we have a heat exchanger, we're just adding heat to the combustion process. We just look at it as a heat addition. And then we come out and we expand that air in the turbine. And then we reject heat to get 
state four back to state one so we're that fresh because um, we're four and one are both at the same pressure but we reject the heat to get the temperature down okay and that's basically what you're doing here when you're rejecting exhaust to the atmosphere still atmospheric pressure we're just rejecting high temperature and we're pulling in fresh low temperature here still have work out in the turbine work in compressor work net is work out minus work in all right so now we got to put our equations to this okay the one thing we have is this is each component if we put our boundary on the heat exchanger we have one inlet one outlet but mass flow is flowing in or to run the turbine we have mass flow flowing in and out or the compressor mass flow rate. so it's open system energy equation now all right so let me write that Well, steady state, so we're not during startup or shutdown. The DEDT goes away, neglecting kinetic and potential. That goes away. So we have one inlet, one outlet on every single one of these devices, right? Compressor, heat exchanger, turbine. So we just, for conservation of mass, the inlets equal the outlet. So we just have. zero we can divide out the mass flow rate and make that little q and little w okay so then we end up up here i'm going to i'm running out of space down below but we divide out the mass flow rate and move the enthalpy over to the other side of the equation we have q minus w equals h out minus h in okay and that's developed from open system conservation energy so now we can look at each process and again there's only heat transfer or work for this one so if we do our thermal efficiency okay work net over q in for the brayton so again it's one minus q out over q in now we need to figure out q out we need to figure out q in well we have heat exchanger for heat out heat exchanger for heat in So we would have, there's only heat in those heat exchangers, so there's no work. So we just have delta H, and we can put in CP delta T because it's ideal gas. Okay, so we put in our CP delta T, the CPs cancel out, we just have an equation with temperatures. This again is just for graphing down here. All right, so I'll, I forgot to go through the TS and PV diagram, but we have one through the compressor isentropic compression we're adding heat at constant pressure through our heat exchanger so we add heat we add entropy so we go from left to right now we have our turbine which expands and lowers the pressure and temperature okay from three to four and now we're rejecting heat so that goes from right to left we're decreasing the entropy by rejecting heat okay And then again, we have isentropic process. The PV diagram typically isn't used too much in an open system. It's more of a closed system. But you can see again the work net here, compression. You're compressing the volume. So you see the volume decreasing, expanding the volume to the turbine. And then heat addition at constant pressure, heat projection at constant pressure. All right, we have isentropic processes here and here. So we have isentropic equations for those processes. They deal with pressure because we have constant pressure processes because P1 is equal to P4 and P2 is equal to P3, right? But between those, we have isentropic processes that we can utilize. And since ideal gas, isentropic relationships, we have these two for those two processes, okay? These pressures, we just like in the closed system one, 
we had the um, compression ratio. Well, now we have a pressure ratio since we're dealing with basically two pressures. We have a lower pressure and a higher pressure, right? So you can think about in this diagram, we have our lower pressure down here and our upper pressure up here, okay? So we have a pressure ratio. So P2 over P1, which is the same as P3 divided by P4, since pressure one is equal to four and two is equal to three. Well, using these isentropic equations and this pressure ratio and manipulating ratios of temperatures here, we can derive a simplified thermal efficiency equation. It just depends upon the pressure ratio and the ratio of specific heat. Okay. In this case, we see pressure ratio increases, thermal efficiency increases. Okay. We have our typical range right here for gas turbine engines. Where they're used, these gas turbines, air propulsion and electric power generation. So na a natural gas power plant. Right, running a, a gas turbine with um, uh, using that for power generation. One thing we have that's going on though is we have some limitations right, in these cycles. So I showed this trend that you just increase pressure ratio, we increase thermal efficiency. Well, there's a limit because if we increase that pressure ratio, we're going to get higher and higher temperatures of T3, what's going into that turbine. Well, the turbine can only handle so much temperature because of material restrictions, right? So if we were to set a max of, uh, for that T3 of 1000 Kelvin, what would give us the maximum work? It's not the pressure ratio of 15, it's not a low pressure of two, it ends up being this pressure ratio of 8.2 that actually gives you that highest work net out if you restrict the temperature to a thousand. Okay. So the max temperature of those turbine blades are something that limits the efficiencies of gas turbines. Okay. One way they keep the temperature down is to use very high air to fuel ratio. So they basically put in a ton of extra air because then that air will absorb some of that heat, that extra air, and keep the temperature down okay. when combustion is occurring. Another thing we had, I talked about work net right here is equal to work out, which is our turbine minus the work of the work of the compressor. So some of that turbine work is going to drive the compressor work, and that's called the back work. And there's a back work ratio, which is just the work of the compressor divided by the work of the turbine. So it shows a percentage of how much work is going back to the compressor to operate the cycle. All right, so development of gas turbines. So where are they going? Again, increasing that turbine inlet temperature. So trying to increase that T3 as high as possible, whether that's making better materials for the turbine blades or what's called the thermal barrier coatings, um, looking at that. So we'll look at, I usually do, I think, an example in heat transfer. When I teach heat transfer, looking at the blades themselves and the temperature the blades experience. Uh, there's also the efficiencies of the turbines and compressors. So there's, you know, you have isentropic efficiencies. You want to increase those higher and higher. And then there's also modifications we can do to increase efficiency, intercooling, regeneration, recuperation, reheating. So what is an actual gas turbine cycle look like versus the ideal? Well, we have those things that we neglected. We have irreversibilities in the turbine and compressors. We have pressure drops, we have heat losses. So here we see the efficiencies of the what actually happens versus because the isentropic efficiencies versus if it was an isentropic compression, same over here. Okay. We also have pressure drop okay, and heat um, during that heat exchanger, and also pressure drop during the other heat exchanger when you're rejecting heat. Okay. 
So we can model the isotropic efficiencies. We looked at that in chapter seven and a little bit in chapter eight. So of a compressor, isotropic efficiency of a turbine. So we could get the actual 2A and 4A. The pressure drop though, again, would require fluids equations. All right, so here we have the Brayton cycle with regeneration. So this is a modification where just like the Stirling cycle and the Erickson cycle, we're using some regeneration or, or what's called recuperation. And what it's doing is, before we get to the TF diagram, we have, you know, going through the turbine, we compress it, we come out of the compressor. Normally, this regen in the Brayton cycle without regeneration, this this regenerator is not here. So we just go and we have a combustor that adds in heat to raise up the temperature to three. Okay. And then we expand to the turbine, and then we exhaust out of the turbine and have our heat rejection to get us back from four to one. Okay. Well. Instead of going all the way from two to three in raising the temperature of that of the fluid going through the air, we pull some of the thermal energy from what would normally get exhausted to the atmosphere. We pull some of that and kind of preheat the air before going in the combustion chamber. So that means if we're still going to three, any preheating is heat we're not having to add in the combustion chamber. Okay, so we have in the TS diagram, one to two is our compressor. If we were going all the way from two to three with the heat addition just from the combustion chamber, we would go all the way along two all the way to three, right? We would have our isotropic expansion through three to four, and then four to one, we would have our heat rejection. Well, instead of rejecting all that heat from four out to the atmosphere, we take that and run it through a regenerator and move some of that thermal energy and preheat from two to five. So now two to five is internal thermal energy from internal inside the cycle. Okay. It's from this four to six. So we are moving that thermal energy and from four to six and two to five is inside the cycle. So this Q regen is inside the cycle. And now we just have to add heat from five to three. So now that is heat in from five to three. And that's heat out from six to one now. Okay, so that means we've saved what we would normally reject here and moved it over here. So that's the regeneration, moving it from one part of the cycle to the other. All right, so what does this mean equation-wise? Here again, it's the same diagram. Well, the regenerator, with the actual heat we're adding from, you know, internally from the regenerator, is how far we go from two to five, right? That's that Q regen, okay? That's the delta H from there. The max we could achieve, let's say if it was a perfect regenerator, the largest thing possible so we could transfer heat the best um, would be this five prime here, okay? And what that comes from is because four is six is what you're transferring heat, the max you could ever get five to is to temperature four. So you could only ever get five because you're transferring heat. You can't go above it in temperature, so you could only ever get to the temperature of four, which is five prime along this line, okay? So that means that's our maximum. This 
five prime minus two or four minus two. Okay. So if we wanted to say, figure out how effective or how good our regenerator is versus perfect, we would have this actual over the max. Okay. If it's under cold air standards, so you have CP delta T, the CP is canceling, you just have these temperatures. Okay. So if we take this and add the regenerator, right, and put this, develop a general efficiency equation, cold air standard, with a regenerator, we have this, okay? If we plot this, okay, we have pressure ratios, increase pressure ratios, this is without regeneration that I just sh I showed earlier for a Brayton cycle. You know, increase the pressure ratio, we increase the efficiency. And then these lines are different um, regenerations, so different ratios of those T1 to T3 with basically regeneration. So we up over here, we get a higher thermal efficiency at these lower pressure ratios. But if we go to high pressure ratios and try to do regeneration, we're gonna actually decrease our efficiency. So it's not good at high pressure ratios. We gotta keep the pressure ratio low if we're gonna use regeneration, okay? So we have a good question of can regeneration be used at high pressure? So the plot tells us it's not good, right? Well, the best way for me to show this, let me, of why it can't be used, let's see if I can erase all my scribbles here. All right, that's enough. All right, so here we have a low pressure ratio, so regeneration can be used. Here we have a high pressure ratio for this one on, on the left. So regeneration can't be used, okay? So this is two, for this one, this is three, this is four, right? This is two for this one, three, four, all right? So regenerator is taking that thermal energy out of that we would normally reject after four. Right after the turbine. So here's four and it preheats it too. So this low temperature, we can have heat go from here to here to preheat from two up, okay? This low pressure ratio. If we go all the way to this high pressure ratio that we have 15, well, here's the outlet of the turbine. Here's the outlet of the compressor while the outlet of the turbine is lower than temperature than in the outlet of the compressor, so we can't even transfer heat from four to preheat to up here because the temperature is too low at four, right? We can only have heat transfer from high to low, right? So we can't, that doesn't help us, okay? So if the pressure ratio is too high, we would have heat going the wrong direction that we want it to and lower the efficiency. And that's what's being shown with these dashed lines. I don't want to, I'm going to stop here just because the other class, actually, actually I'm going to go one more slide. I don't want to get too far the other class, but the Brayton cycle, now we start getting into more what's actually happening. And I'm sure you're looking at it and go, oh, great, 10 states all these processes, well, you really just got to work your state, well, yourself through the process one by one, okay? But this one has Brayton cycle. We have intercooling, reheating, and regeneration. So the regenerator we've talked about, okay? Now we've adding intercooling and reheating. All right, so let's walk through. We have a compressor where we're adding pressure and temperature. Then we have an intercooler and that's rejecting heat at constant pressure, okay? And then we compress again, raise the pressure and temperature by compressing, 
and we get through our regenerator at constant pressure we add some thermal energy and get it to five and then we have our combustion chamber where we had some heat in okay and we get to six now we're at the turbine and we expand it lowers pressure and temperature to seven well we've lowered the pressure and temperature but we have a reheater where we add some extra some heat back in we can't change the pressure there so it's still the same pressure that's lower but we've added some heat back in and now we go again to a second turbine and expand and lower the pressure and temperature and now we can go and use what's normally a good exhaust it's the atmosphere at nine to run it through the regenerator to move some of that thermal energy to preheat four to five and ten to one is our heat out okay. so they simplify a lot of times the circuit you got to just recognize that that's heat out they have 10 and then they have a one when they're talking about the Brayton cycles just to lower the number of components they're plotting but that's the heat out right there um, so if we now look at this on the diagram one to two isentropic compression through the compressor two to one Remember, we're rejecting heat, so pressure is being maintained constant. We have a constant pressure line, but we're going from right to left because we're rejecting heat. Okay, so now we go to four, and now we're or to three, sorry, and we compress it again. And in this case, we're raising it right back to the same temperature at two. So we isentropically compress it to four. We have our regenerator here that we potted in the last slide, so four to five, constant pressure, we're raising it there. And then our combustion chamber, we're adding heat, right? So we're increasing our entropy, constant pressure. So we add heat, we're going from left to right, reject heat, we're going from right to left. So we add heat here. Now we get to our turbine, we expand, isentropically expand down six to seven then we reheat it in our reheater we're adding heat again so we're adding heat so we're going from left to right at constant pressure we, we raise it right back to that same temperature in this case and we expand to that second turbine to nine then we go and move that thermal energy from nine to ten this is where we have the regenerator moving that thermal energy from from nine to 10 to four to five. And then 10 to one is our actual heat rejection process. Okay. So you gotta, in these cycles, you gotta understand the individual components and then the diagram. And that's really what helps you kind of put the two together. Okay. The last thing I'll go through in the next class is just the um, really it's just a few slides on the jet propulsion cycle which is really kind of quick we just kind of talk about it um, if you have any questions let me know and then we'll do examples the rest of the class next class on the chapter nine okay just to clarify from nine to ten it's a huh? constant oh, yeah. it's a constant pressure yes so it's all these, this regenerator is just like a heat exchanger. It's based, it's just a heat exchanger, but call it a regenerator because it's moving thermal energy internally to the cycle, okay? So this pressure is the same here and this pressure is the same here. They're not touching, they're just moving heat from one fluid section to the other. And the combustion chamber gains constant pressure, reheaters, constant pressure, intercoolers, constant pressure. Is some of that heat out go back into the compressor? Some of the heat out go back into the compressor. The, like, this? No, this because you, you have to get back to the same initial state. So you reach from 10, you mean from 10 to 1? Yeah. You have, yeah. To, you have to reject all the way back to that initial state to 1. Because if you don't, now you're you're over here somewhere and you just cut the cycle off and have to be shorten it and you get less work so if you keep trying to do something like that you shorten your area 
and you start moving those things and you actually lower the efficiency. So you have to go all the way back to that initial state and that's like a fresh, it's basically like fresh air, you know, one atmosphere, 20 degrees Celsius, where we're rejecting to the atmosphere at some high temperature, maybe 500 degrees Celsius or something like that. All right, thank you. I see what you're saying. Yep. Any other questions? All right, well, then that's it. And uh, we'll, again, I'll, we'll have a, just a few more slides next class and then uh, examples for the rest of the class. Okay, so I had like two questions that weren't related to this. Um, so for the uh, uh, project. Let's, let's, okay, go ahead. I didn't know if you wanted to meet individually or. or well, it, it might be better to be individual then. Okay, then uh, just go to the my contact for office hours. It's a different room. Okay, and just open that up. Yep. All right. Be right back.